I had to Professor uh, Dilip. So, um, and it seems that um, actually ahead of myself, what I'm going to say is likely to be said more on, on Friday. He said. So it's, my, my contribution today is um, programmatic um, um, in, its, in its nature. Um, <coughs> Um, <clears throat> Professor Menon has made it, um, or has brought it to my attention that uh, there has been some kind of progress in so far as um, language policy is concerned in India, except that regional languages in India are yet to acquire epistemological status that English possesses. This language could, he seems to imply, gain an epistemic traction matching English and other Western languages. This implication is an object of my sympathy. In the measure of my epistemic consensus that South Africa, it's university. So, since I know nothing of the structure of Indian languages, syntax forms, etc., I'm in a precarious position to comment much. My concern then is the written form, the alphabet, as it were, of African languages in South Africa. Unlike, say, a Chinese language, I think, the writing structure is largely, if not completely, a determination of European civilizing mission. Of course, these languages that we call African in South Africa, they use the Latin alphabet. What, in short, would be the implications of translating, say, Derrida or Levinas into these African languages, for example? A way of, of, of short circuiting this concern, of course, is to predicate them black them, I mean, these languages. Call them black African languages instead of African languages just. In which case, we acknowledge the near irreversible, perhaps a complete irreversible, colonial desecration of much that is Africa. Although this need not be a slippery slope to hopelessness, however indeterminate this hope might be. Or in or imply a longing for the so-called authentic Africa, as my post-colonial friends or critics would say. That English, as Professor Mann has it, comprehensively won the battle over the Indian and by extension South African mind is beyond disputation. I agree. You will recall that the youth of June, 7, June 16 fought legitimately, I think, for English prominence over Africans. I will not go into details here. <clears throat> Nonetheless, black African languages in their spoken form remain a generative side, quite generative as I notice in relation to the near elusive black popular expression in South Africa. Among these expressions, the spiraling of Motswako is quite instructive on this score. Motswako is a genre of hip hop um, in South Africa. Quite quickly, that is to say, blackly. It employs Nguni, English, and such languages, often within a track, betraying unwittingly, perhaps, the near relational coherence or incoherence thereof of black African languages. Now, that's just part, the first part of my, my, my concerns. I want to get to the problem that South African universities. Now, South African universities could. Professor Mann is correct, move away from vulgar linguistic performances, which is what Betts possibly seems to be engaged in, to say, well, you know, we could have English so to Zoom as part of, of that which we employ, you know, to, 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 to communicate amongst ourselves. So if from, to move, a move, a move away from vulgar linguistic performances, what he calls mere functional multilingualism, that is but a, a higher version of Fanaga law. <laughs> of course, he affirms in words Yongo here and his brother Paris, Franz Fanon. Language is a means of communication as it is a carrier of culture. South Africa could, I agree, learn a few things from India's ante or post colonial experience. The fact that Indian languages and all Indeed, Arabic or Persian were seen as the repository of literary imagination, and at universities, one could opt to study this language, but not as a repository of concept and social imagination. Still, 
Could black popular expression, I mean Muzoko here, kind of radical, if possibly a subversive version of Ghana, Fanaka law, a blend of English and Catalan, which as I say, teach us anything, epistemically speaking, in the measure of their capacity to condition a possibility of South Africa's university self fashioning the possibility of speculating into the future that is possibly past. All this, of course, is a slippery slope to thinking the colonized as such can own the colonized language, English, for instance. Such thinking is, let me accept it once, uncongenial to my intellectual temperament. Uncongenial since English, it is English, its cultural baggage in the new colony, the new Union of South Africa, the place where we are at right now, is a social fact at once immanent and transcendent in the being, non-being of the colonized, say the coconut, the black student at that university. It is a social fact, which is to say, English is here to stay. Say it need not stay to the pleasure of an English purist. Professor Njabundo has made this remark in the past. All this, of course, all right. This is my point. In a similar way that English could shape the development of Afrikaans, for example, they share linguistic structure, after all, I think. Could we not then radicalize, conceptually speaking, the already radical, imaginatively speaking, Fanagolo, which is no pigeon, Motswako. The point here, of course, for me is not to celebrate the music itself. Now, I imagine myself, for example, spitting a version of Motswako. Motswako means basically a mixture. I imagine myself speaking Motswako in and through a social intellectual hall, provided to use Menon's words, translation funds are set up for creating a corpus of social science and scientific literature. I wish to play a, a sound, it's about two minutes, of what this Motswako sounds like for those who are not familiar with this a product. Um. Song for uh, 
the drama coming soap opera on SABC One, um, um, Skim Sam. Um, we need to read the Skim Sam. <laughs> so, as I said, I imagine talking like this in my lecture. In fact, or imagine grading a Mutuaco written essay, a line on, say, life in Malte. A line, something like this. There, in routing, blackness is a scene of crawling. In other words, the black mouting, Osanzi Aohova, Asinka Lagat. So sad, Osanzi Akolota, Asikhodova. You will need to see in these words, or terms, if you will, marks of conceptual potentiality. Socio philosophically or spatial temporally speaking. Who is Ngalagat after all? Who and what is Ngalagat if not the opposite of the damned of the earth? And what is Hodova said? He that does not lack, she that has capacity for friendship because she's wealthy. By wealth, I mean capacity for love. We have a compelling reason, simply to me, for vet university professors and students to learn to soon to all this. A compelling reason if we wish to provide an appropriate account of the crisis that is around. All this, all this, you know, the radicalization of, of the radical funeral aside, we should still invest, of course, in the black African languages as separate entities. In closing, let me say this. Thinking the radical Falanga law should at the same instant have us explore a black religious cultural Falanga law. Conceptually not the same thing as hybridity, you will know by now that the category of hybridity has brought itself into disrepute. So this Fanagalo, the religious cultural Fanagalo, is but the need to rethink black African religions alongside. I agree with Professor Moon once again. Confucianism, Islam, for all its muddy history in its political currency on the continent. It seems impossible, in fact, to think the problem of wealth or love for the, colon for the colonized outside such theo-aesthetic categories as sacrifice or an altar, or such theo-philosophical categories as indeterminacy or infinity, if, for example, you read Levinas and such characters. On this score, the University must reinstitute the religious de studies department, I think, or the Center for Indian Studies in South Africa could eventually take on this role. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm happy for us to have further discussions on these questions. Thank you very much. In this room, uh, I think very provocative way he's brought forward the idea that Neville Alexander many years ago raised when he said, when did English become an academic language? One of the reasons why we find English so difficult to speak is because it is a bastardized language. There is no consistency of pronunciation. There are words which come to it from all possible languages on earth. So the Oxford English Dictionary brings a new edition in the year. Twerking is now in the dictionary. Anyway, but apart from that, in, from various continents. So, English, when it broke away from that high Latin, which was all, which was the language of academic scholarship, English was merely a fanagalo, right? and now it has become the language which is the master narrative through which we narrate our lives and our ideas. So I think Gabriel, you've touched upon an absolutely important point. I suppose it's a matter of time. <laughs> I, I would like to share a, a few remarks. Uh, they will be delivered in no, no particular order, uh, which I guess is, uh, is an expression of a kind of uh, uh, a resolved uh, dimension of my position on, on this question of language. Um, I, I would like to make those remarks with a totally open, open mind. Uh, the um, part of me uh, tends to believe that this is 
This is a known issue. And, and I can see Dilip expressing his uh, uh, will uh, such as the approval. approval. Uh, <laughs> part of me uh, uh, believes that this, this might be a known issue. Uh, what might be a known issue? The issue of, of uh, whether uh, we lose ourselves in the act by which we we practice languages that have come from from afar French English uh, Portuguese and so forth and so on and I think that there, there is enough evidence to show that where a language was born um, does not entirely determine its uh, capacity to to be thoroughly reappropriated uh, in its point of destination and fundamentally remained both in its uh, syntactic structures, uh, its grammar, uh, the way it is written, the way it is spoken. I think that all languages of the world are under a certain number of circumstances amenable to that process of, uh, if you want, this affiliation that I can speak French in a way that has nothing to do with the way French is spoken in Bordeaux, in Lyon, or, or in Paris. And yet, it is French. It is, uh, it may not be the French French, but it is French. So, so it seems to me that it is in the nature of any human language to, to use the uh, term, to circulate, provided that the circumstances of its circulation and reappropriation are in place. And therefore, part of me tend to not believe in these major ideas that ha has been uh, there, especially in, in African uh, uh, thought, that language is, uh, so-called foreign language, is uh, by definition a space of alienation. A point, since you mentioned Fanon, uh, a point he, he made quite clear uh, in his, uh, in the first chapter of, of the Wretched of, no, not the Wretched, but the other one, uh, the Black Skin, White Mask, it is dedicated to the question of, of language. Foreign, lang foreign language being understood as the, the space of our self-alienation. So I would like to put on the table to revisit that, that proposition. To revisit it in, uh, in view of the history of so-called foreign languages in our continent. Because the history of those of the uses of foreign languages in our continent dismisses uh, that, that proposition. It goes counter to that proposition. So uh, the question then is, at what point is it that French, Portuguese, English become native languages? How long does it take for them to be considered as native languages? Or is it that there will remain foreign languages ad vitam eternum until, as Zuma says, Jesus, um, <laughs> until the Savior, <laughs> until the second coming, if you want? I think that that is a serious question we have to examine. Now, uh, a second set of remarks. Since we don't have much time, one can only be telegraphic. For those of us who uh, have a little bit of knowledge, Dilip mentioned you know, old in, uh, Indian uh, tradition where time is almost, uh, has no limits. Those of you who are familiar with a number of Judeo-Christian mythologies, you know, they, they tell us something really interesting about uh, language, which we might, we might 
I want to revisit two 